All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for logging in. I think we probably have some more coming in the next few minutes, but we're going to get started. It's uh, Riley and PK here. We've been on uh, quarantine. We haven't left my office in the last three weeks. We just sit here and make new PowerPoints. So we're glad that you guys tuned in for another uh, about 45 minute webinar. Today's topic is going to be why DO. Um, it's not meant to be a commercial by any means, um, but more just some useful information. If you are someone familiar with Whitecap, um, you know that we recently partnered um, with DO Implant System. We wanted to update you on some of the, the neat features within the DO system. We want to keep this really practical and clinical from a um, doctor perspective, but we just wanted to share some insight um, about the DO system. So glad that you're there. We um, Again, make sure your volume is turned up. Um, everyone has been muted, just so you know, so if you're trying to talk, we won't hear you. If you want to communicate with us, you can send some questions through the question and answer section, and we will try to address those near the end. I think we have to start out by getting it right. D-O, D-I-O, it doesn't sound like D-O, but just drop the I, it's just D-O. It's not D-I-O. Not Dio. Everyone not thinks it's Dio, including me for the first month I heard of this place, but it's not Dio, it's D-O, D-O. D-O. And now that we've had that conversation, we are not partnered with a diode implant system. Yeah, it's a D-O. D-O implant system. If we did partner with a Dio, probably be a laser, I'm guessing. That's but, right. But okay. Well, yeah. this, don't worry, this is not a webinar just on enunciation. We got that over with. So DO it is. We're going to go ahead and get started. Again, use that question and answer. We will get to them near the end. Um, and if we can't get to all of them, then we will reach out individually and make sure those are answered. Again, at the very end of the lecture as well, you will have our emails posted and um, you can email us directly. We're happy to, to respond. So with that said, we're going to get the party started. I think there it goes. You know, I did my first implant in the basement of Oregon Health Sciences uh, School of Dentistry in Portland, Oregon in 1988. And that was the most exciting day of my dental education. I mean, why wouldn't it be? That is so cool. I put a dental implant in tooth number 22 area and tooth number 27. I reflected a flap distal to 22 and distal to 27. It was like crazy cool for me. And that started my addiction to dental implantology. And then I uh, graduated uh, from dental school in 1989. And I uh, took and I, I literally waxed up the hater bar for this case from 22 to 27. I uh, did it all in, in the lab at night. And then I went into a one-year fellowship of which I did about 10 implants. And then in 1990, uh, I bought my first system. It was IMZ, you can see it on the screen. This was a European uh, company. They had the most novel thing back then. They had a intermobile element. It was a Teflon sleeve that mimicked the periodontal ligament fiber. I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. It could not get any cooler. I placed about uh, 10 or 12 of those my very first year. I did about 20 the next year and all of the intermobile elements broke. The screw broke off. The, the idea was phenomenal, but the reality was flawed. So I became the screw remover king of dental implantology. I was very discouraged. I did it obviously under uh, guarantee to my, my patients. And then as, as time went on, Calcitec came on board. They had a little different bell or a little different whistle. And then I went to Bicon and then another bell or whistle to BioHorizons. Then another bell or whistle emerged and I went to other companies, Stereos, Nobel, Camlog, um, Implant Direct, Zimmer, Ankylos, Simpler, Hyacin. Then it seemed like the last 10 years, in my opinion, nothing really emerged sensational. There wasn't additional bells or whistles. The patents had uh, lapsed and uh, people were kind of mimicking everybody and they gave you what we all love is a Morse taper, a uh, platform switching implant that worked. 
Now, in the last three years, all of a sudden, there seems to be this renaissance of, of amazing thinking, and it all has to do and centered around the uh, connection of all of our digital tools. My first digital acquisition tool was the CBCT many years ago. It was the hugest acquisition of my life. Many of you have recently gone through that, and I feel what you feel is it's so expensive. And then you add the CBCT, and then all of a sudden, you know, you realize that the intraoral camera uh, is, is, is seamlessly connecting to that. And all of a sudden, we have a digital acquisition of data that is very powerful. And so we're going to talk about the IMZ through Hyacinth, what we've learned and what we've grown with and what we've come to realize is important. And now there's this new thing on the block and it's not been embraced by any other implant company from an A to Z solution for us as doctors, which hugely benefits our patients. So this is why I am totally enamored by this this concept. It's my dream. If 10 years ago, someone would have said, you could have a custom abutment made and a PMMA temporary made before you did the surgery, I'd say, you're nuts. What are you smoking? What are you on? Because that is so outrageous. It was so crazy to come to understand today, we have this disruptive technology that is forced all of us to reconsider what we're doing with our implants and how we're going to do it for our patients. And so that is uh, my kind of uh, precursor message to what we're going to go over today. So we flew out to Korea last year, went to Busan, saw their headquarters here. They're a large company. I'm really impressed. We wanted to go and check them out. Um, over 600 employees, I believe it's over 700 now. They're growing very, very quick. Um, got to meet with the leadership, the ownership of the company, and uh, we were really, really um, impressed with their thoughtfulness, with their creativity, um, and with, like PK said, their, their desire to own the entire turf A to Z. That's one thing you're going to see in a couple of slides is I kind of feel like Dio is like the, the apple of the phone market you know, they, they make their own screen, they make their own processor, they do all of that Apple so that everything works seamlessly together. Dio is very similar in terms of them owning every step of the process so that the entire process is seamless. You're not counting on some third party something to make the process work. And so that's just a little information about the company. I want to get into kind of what our agenda is specifically. We're going to start talking off talking about the actual guide design interface, the way the sleeve meets the guide. We have a couple of unique stories about that. We're gonna talk about the surgical kit, um, the hydrophilic surface that they have, this concept of anatomical abut abutments. We're gonna talk about that at depth and, and what that means for us. Um, custom abutment or custom protocols that they have, and then web-based portal and virtual simulations. We're gonna start with the implant design, however. Um, I think it's important you just kind of have a, a picture of what we're talking about. This is their implant right here. They have basically two um, categories of implants within their two-piece system. So in the middle, you, they do have the very narrow mini implants, but in their regular catalog, they have what's called a UF2 and a UV active. Now these two implants are identical in their physical structure. What's unique about the UV active is it is packaged a little bit differently and gone through an activation process. The packaging is just as important as the process. And we're gonna talk about that, but just as kind of a tutorial, UF2 is the implant that we're referring to. It does come in a UV active packaging and we'll talk about that, but we love the design of the implant. If you look at the surface of the implant, notice at the top, the picture looks a little bit different it's because it has a different porosity level on the surface here than it does down here. This part of the implant is likely going to be residing in your trabeculated bone, and the surface of the implant is ideal for trabeculated bone integration. The top here is a different surface to help with cortical bone. The other thing I'll mention, it's a tapered implant, but it has a straight body in the middle. By having a straight body in the midsection, you're actually increasing surface area, 
that increase in surface area is going to give us a higher likelihood of getting primary stability and therefore allowing immediate temporization, which is great when that's what the treatment plan is. In the past, there was just a tapered implant or a parallel walled implant. And this is just about 60% parallel walled. And then as you get into anatomical issues at the apical end of the implant, which the anatomy changes, this keeps you from perforating. Uh, in the buckle or, or wherever you might anatomically perforate, as you might imagine. So that, that alone uh, intrigued me. Another thing, Riley, that I really like is this has a little bevel at the top. And that little bevel at the top, isn't, it's called an open thread, but it's not a continued contiguous thread, which then, if you lose a little bone, becomes the water slide for bacteria. So I do like that. This micro etching here uh, makes perfect sense to me because the bone is less vascular in this area. And why make it so rough? Why make it, uh, uh, you know, trabecular bone has spaces in it. Cortical bone does not. So the microstructure of that, the micro etching of this, I think is, is uh, very thoughtful. If you really, you know, get down to it, it's a thoughtful, proposition. I really like these big grooves. And, and it, this picture does not really do it justice, but there's a big groove right there that when blood gets in there and blood is the magic to osseointegration, as you know, that counteracts because it's in four places every hundred and, or every three, three places, uh, 120 degrees, there's this groove. And as this integrates, that mitigates torsional rotation. I think that's very thoughtful as well very big power threads, a flat end. There's nothing I don't like about the design and it gets even better. The connection real quick, um, a lot of competitors, you know, I think everyone knows some type of conical or Morse taper connection is where it's at with something that's anti-rotation, that is the hex. So looking at the left here, most connections have some type of Morse taper at the coronal aspect and then the anti-rotational hex. And that's fantastic. What's really unique with DIO is they're providing what's called a dual contact. So you have a superior and an inferior Morse taper. And by doing that, essentially, you're getting more stability of the implant to abutment. And we know through lots of research that a really tight connection with no movement at the abutment implant interface is really, really important. And so this is neat. How did they do it? They shrunk their connection a little bit in the hex area. The hex is just a little bit shorter than a lot of other hexes that go into implants, but that's just fine. And with that additional space, they put in additional Morse taper. And so I like that. Um, the hope with this, and they're getting some research on this, is you can get more long axis dispersion of force because the hex is now deeper, not the hex, the Morse taper is deeper into the implant. I think this practically makes a lot of sense. The stability increase makes a lot of sense. The connection is right on par, one of the most sophisticated out there. It just made sense to me. You look at this, where the cursor is, this is a tall hex. The hex really doesn't give you uh, a, a seal like the conical seal. So the conical seal is really what's doing all the work. This is just for a timing rotation. So it seems a little bit weird that there was so much real estate uh, dedicated to this versus here we've shrunk that down. I, I'm wondering if they could shrink it a little more and give more of this uh, secondary conical seal. So that conical seal or, or Morse taper is deeper in the implant. Just what you're saying, the forces are distributed deeper into the implant rather than right up here. And my experience, that's where you see them break after 10 or 12, 15 years of being beat up by a real big bruxer, where this I think is gonna make a difference. In, in kind of mitigating that. And, and, and really, it, it's, it's, it's really all about the bone and the forces in that apical third. And it's, it, the research is clear. It's dispersing the forces more down the long axis. I mean, I don't mean to, to repeat you, but it's kind of a deep subject. Yeah. But that, that, is, that is what it's doing. And so anyway, we're really excited about that. This is their, uh, their kind of um, pro um, portfolio of implants. They have a narrow platform. It's a 1.7 millimeter hex platform. The diameters of the implants are 3.0 and 3.3. 3. 
and they started an 8.5 length, go to 15, and then they have a regular and a wide. The regular and wide share the same size platform, so it's 2.5 mill millimeter platform, and the diameters range from 3.8 all the way up to 7. Here's what's unique. If you look here at the lengths in blue, they have a protocol of drilling, and we talked a lot about this, um, I think it was two weeks ago, the drilling protocol, but their protocol mitigates heat with slow drilling and then irrigation between drills that we can get a 15, 16, even 18 millimeter length implant, which sometimes is advantageous for immediate load. If you're doing full arch and you need to grab some apical bone so you can put temporaries in place, that's a really, really great option if you can drill an osteotomy without overheating the bone. And another thing is, you know, we, we were kind of a pendulum swung. We were saying very long implants. When I first started, we had an 18 and a 20 and a 22 and a 24 and a 26 millimeter implant because the Branamark protocol was to engage two cortical plates. So if you're putting a number 22 in, you got quite a bit of a chin. That's a 28 millimeter implant. Well, the problem was, is we couldn't drill to 28 with the standard drilling uh, protocols back then without hurting the bone. Now with the digital information we have, we are optimizing our width to cortical plates, buccal and lingual, buccal and palatal, whatever, and then we're optimizing our length to cortical boundaries, but keeping it in trabecular bones. So because of that, we're able to do longer implants. I think it's kind of weird that one's blue and one's green. Really, these should all be blue or all be green because the connection is the same. Exactly. So, so really, and I'll tell you what's happened. And some of you are going, what? 3-0? 3-3? Yeah, that's cool. But what's even cooler, see, with my highest, and I used to just go with the narrow, was 3-5. Then I went back to the 4-0. What's emerging is one of my favorite implants, and I never saw it coming, is this 3-8. This 3.8 is special. This 3.8 has just the right amount of space to put it where I otherwise would have put a 3.5. But I'm now putting a 3.8 and getting away with it and I have a much stronger connection. The other thing that's interesting is this 5.5. I've never had a 5.5. It was always, I used a five or a six. The 5.5 five to me is kind of like the 3.8, it just fits. So these, are, these two have emerged as my powerhouse and I'm really enjoying them. I think the thing I should say is the kits to prepare the osteotomies for the six, six, five, and seven is a wide kit. That, that I can agree with why they changed the colors. This is just a standard kit and this is the narrow kit. And that has to do with preparing the bone to insert these implants. But it is nice. There's only two connections that you worry about. The regular connection, which is also the wide connection, and then the narrow connection. Um, but you're not, what some companies are doing is putting the narrow connection in all of their implant platforms um, just to make it easy for us. I don't think you want a 1.7 hex on a seven millimeter implant. You want a larger hex. The 2.5 is a great size. And so that's kind of the lineup of the implants there. Let's get into some other more pertinent topics. So um, this might sound funny, but the way that the sleeve interfaces this guide is remarkable. And if you haven't done a lot of guided surgery um, or you've never done any, you might not have thought a lot about this, but we've had the pleasure and the disappointment of making a lot of different guides in office over the last few years and realizing that the whole accuracy of your surgical guide is how well that sleeve, meaning that blue piece right there, how well that sleeve fits within the guide. Believe it or not, most systems, you will print a guide and then you will have just a press fit sleeve that you actually glue in. And you could theoretically and quite easily put that sleeve in a few degrees off angle as you're pressing it, not getting it perfectly flush. One of our first cases, real quick story, we got the guide hot off the printer, got it prepared, glued the sleeve in, went to surgery. I start placing the implant, showing my dad how cool guided surgery is. And a half hour into surgery, I lost the implants. I didn't know where they were. They were not in the bone. I drilled all these holes and I took x-rays and they were like perpendicular to the roots of the adjacent teeth. I didn't know what happened. PK sits down and saves me. All of you should have a PK in office that can just save you when the awry um, cases go awry. Anyways, we search and find out. When the out, cases go awryly. 
when they go awryly. Awryly, then not awry. I don't know what awry is, but I definitely know a case that's gone awryly. And then you get a PK and then, and then you <laughs> fix it to make it perfect. Yeah. So um, the case went awryly and <laughs> we're taking these x-rays and we can't figure out what's going on. What had happened is the sleeve did not set up properly with the cement before we started doing the surgery and they turned about 20, 30 degrees inside the surgical guide, the metal sleeve did. So I placed these implants in the soft tissue and they were just falling down in the soft tissue. And that was disappointing. So that's a, that's a really fun story. So with that story in mind, this really caught our eye. They have a proprietary software that creates a lock and key fit. And you can see that little channel, this blue goes in and it sits here initially, and then you rotate it and you lock it in place. If you want to double lock it, you then can put a little resin in here and light cure it, inhibiting a reverse rotation. But that lock and key ensures it only goes in one way, and that one way is perfectly accurate. When I first saw that, I thought, oh my gosh, that is remarkable. I've worked with a lot of guide companies. I've seen a lot of this stuff made. I've never seen something so intuitive that is so important. I mean, the guide might fit on the teeth, but if that sleeve is not in the perfect spot, your surgery is not going to be anything special. The other thing too I like about it is I don't have the caustic residue of, of the cement. I don't know really if that's a, a valid uh, concern, but to me, I'm thinking, what if it oozes out? What if it's bubbling there? What if somehow it's not all the way cured and I enter the surgical site with that? So that, that, I, I, I like the idea a lot. I've never had one of these move at all and, and never had that concern. The other thing I like about their, their, their whole uh, guide system is it's so amazing. The fit is incredible. How did they get that fit, Riley? I know it took a lot because their fit is better than our fit. And we thought we had it as good as it could get. Yeah, it comes down to a couple of things. First and foremost, I will say this, the diagnostic quality has to be superior to maybe what we're used to doing. Um, one um, headache I have had working with DO is just my own sloppiness, and that is that they demand very, very accurate impressions. The other um, thing that I will mention, and this kind of comes to that point about like the Apple iPhone, is they've built their own printers. They have also designed their own resins all for the purpose of building these guides with their proprietary software. And so I think you get a fit like that, first from really good diagnostics, obviously, second from hardware and software that was specifically designed for one purpose with one company touching it and handling it. They did not, you think of this, they're an implant company that decided to hire engineers and physicists to make resin and printers. And by the way, they don't even sell the printers or resin. It's all for their office, their in lab use. The reason they did that was to get a fit like this. That's really impressive. You know, when, when um, Dio was kind of courting us, I didn't care about anything other than the end, end outcome. So we enter oral scanned a couple of my patients, several, three of them, and we went ahead and built uh, guides. And then, you know, it was this big moment. Can we make PK happy? And uh, the surgeries were disappointing. And I'm thinking, this is crap. I'm not doing this. This is not working. And then we went back and we, uh, there was some, <laughs> all the issues were mine. We didn't have the most accurate STL acquisition as we should have. And they pointed it out after we rescanned everything, made some new guides that, that hour and then did it. And it was perfect. So if you have a little bit of an issue uh, when you first embrace the system, look at yourself. It, it cannot have sloppiness in the STL intraoral acquisition. That was our office's issue. We thought we were doing it okay because the past acquisitions were serving well. We just didn't know how absolutely buckle, lingual, occlusal perfection we had to have in our acquisition. And, and the problem was mine. So I had to kind of... Uh, you know, swallow some of my pride and then re, re, redid them. And, and then I became a, you know, an avid fan of this, this workflow. Well, what we didn't appreciate was the fact that an STL file, maybe it's off by, I don't know, 70 microns. 
but that 70 microns doesn't mean your implant's going to be off 70 microns because maybe that's pretty dang good. Um, 70 microns off on your guide fit might equal a millimeter and a half, two millimeter of a different apical position of your implant. And so that was kind of an aha moment to see some research and see all of that. So the di diagnostic um, demand is very high, but it's very appropriate. It's not like it's without purpose or reason. And so I think that's important to, to note here. But again, we're already, gosh, only almost 30 minutes into this, and we've really just talked about how cool the guide is and the design of the implants. There's a lot more here, but this this is obviously where tire is that, meets the is road. Is that code for me to shut up? No, it's code, what are you it's really code, saying, it's code for Come me. On, it's code for me to Come shut on. up and talk faster. All right, get it going. So um, the kit. Now I'm going to jump over this really quick, just mainly because we gave a lecture on this a couple of days ago, a couple of weeks ago. And if you missed it, it's on our Facebook page. Um, it's on slow your drilling down. It talks about our drilling protocol. What I love about their kit, it's what I call a hybrid guide kit where it does use a tube or key for the initial drills, creating initial, very, very accurate osteotomy. And then a principle called dual contact drilling with the subsequent drills. These are the drills I'm kind of highlighting. First on the left is the tube drill and then everything else being keyless. A key system and a keyless system have both advantages and disadvantages. The DO Navi system takes the advantages of a key system, the advantages of a keyless system, and then gets rid of the disadvantages of both by creating a hybrid kit. That is an hour lecture given in about 30 seconds. Check out that lecture. It's a great lecture. We want to comment though a minute about their actual burrs and their cutting surface. You know, this, this, uh, this whole cutting burr, this burr is totally unique. All of the action is right down here at the apical end. It's done at 50 to 100 RPMs without water. But if you were to blow this end up, this is what you see a little bit. And then if you were to look at this little notch here, this is what you're getting. So basically the very first osteotomy that goes in with the key or the tube gets it precisely where it should be. Then this subsequent burr is this that fits it. And then this cuts the additional diameter. So there's the additional diameter cut. So I'm, I, and then when you really look at it, this is like four I-beams put together. This I-beam, an I-beam here, here, and here for rigid, rigid strength. So there isn't a def, uh, you know, it's not bending or twisting or, or, or becoming less than as, as exact as it can be. So that's, that's the, that is absolutely a wonderful thing. We had been talking for years about biologic drilling so we were using uh, burrs intended by engineer design to spin fast, but we were spinning them slow. That was kind of our way, clinician's way of doing it a little better. Now, all of a sudden, Dio has a better designed burr to do the no water slow drilling to optimize the accuracy and, and the lack of trauma to the bone. And I think as you Guys, do your cases, you'll come to see and appreciate this. However, I've said all of that, I will tell you, you can still screw this up. There's a 10 second rule that you don't wanna bear down more than 10 seconds. Well, that's arbitrary according to the pressure you're bearing. So I would say, always remember you're drilling on a living organism and less is best. And I think you'll be, you'll be fine, but don't try to Rambo this. Even you guys up in uh, Idaho near the border of uh, Oregon. <laughs> yeah, you guys watch it. Yeah, you guys, uh, you know who I'm talking about, Brian. <laughs> so um, I think you're getting the point that sometimes these small little details that maybe we don't ever really think about make a really big difference. You know, how the guide sleeve is glued in or, or locked in, the actual cutting edge, the diameter jump from one drill to the next. These are small little differences. This is where I love to just kind of piggyback uh, my dad and all of his experience working with those almost 15 other implant systems is he has an eye for this stuff that really means something. And sometimes you don't know what even to look at. And, um, and so I, I hope that these little details, I hope you recognize they are details, but these details are what makes a whole, the whole difference in our clinical setting. So let me jump on and let's talk about this hydrophilic surface. This, this is a big topic that's happening in the industry most implant companies today, big name companies, have some type of hydrophilic 
implant. And the hydrophilic implant um, is, is a process of making the implant more wettable so that you can get the blood to attach to it, the right cellular attachment, and basically increase the, the healing process by decreasing the healing time. Um, and PK and I actually are going to give a one hour a lecture just on this in two weeks from now. It's going to be at a different time. I'm going to put a little plug in for it right now. It'll be in the morning um, on a Monday in two weeks on the 27th. And we'll get some information for that. But this is going to go out to a global audience, not just um, in the, the US here. And so we're going to talk a lot more about this, but we want to go through and just share a couple of thoughts about this hydrophilic surface and why that's so important. And this is probably one of the coolest things that I've ever seen in implantology. It is my opinion that this is going to change uh, the future for us. Change in what? I think less peri-implantitis. I think faster ability to restore. I think ultimately, and this is what's so exciting, the bone to implant contact is going to be optimized because of the blood implant contact is optimized. It can't work any other way. And I don't, I don't care to know all the, the science be, behind that, but for me as a clinician, I have placed implants in a failed implant site, 28 days later went back and I eschewed it and had 71 and 72 in a number 10 and restored it in 28 days from placement of an extracted implant. I'm sorry, but that blows my brain because I didn't want her to come back in 28 days. It was a front office screw up. Sorry, Bobby, or whoever did that. But uh, it was a, just a miscommunication and I wanted her back in 60 days, but she came back in 28. It ISQ'd beautifully. We went ahead and proceeded with uh, impressions and all of that stuff. So I'm a big fan of this. Essentially what you're doing, you're taking an implant, you're applying UV radiation or UV light, and what it's doing, it is removing some of the surface contaminants, basically the organic um, debris like hydrocarbons that develop on the surface of titanium. Now, equally important to the light is the capsule that it's in. I'm going to show you a quick video of what this actually looks like, because this might be a little confusing what we're talking about. I'm not just saying take your hearing light and you know, look at the implant. This machine is the UV activator. You basically open the door, you order a UV activated implant, which has this very special capsule that you're gonna see in just a second. This is half the battle. That capsule is very proprietary, acts as a prism with some special gases in there that we can't tell you. We'd have to kill you with it if we told you. And then it activates it for 20 seconds. So you're gonna see it push start. There's gonna be a 20 second countdown. And then you get the disco light on. That light is just perfect magic is actually happening down in the pain and then it comes out and the implant is now activated so you would theoretically do this let's say you're about one drill from being done with your osteotomy prep you tell your staff member I'm ready for a four five by ten and then they will open the package so by the time you're ready for the implant this 20 second cycle has just been completed this was all debuted one year ago uh about a year ago uh, at the IDS meeting, the International Dental Show, which is the biggest dental show in the world. It's held every other year in Cologne, Germany. I've had the privilege of speaking there uh, by invitation, which was a great honor. But what happened is they, they put booths together with UV activation uh, emphasis. Uh, a competitor of DIO set up early and their, their activation machine did it 24 hours ahead of time. The other competitor came in and it was even longer time. Not, not ahead of time, required. Required. So if you're going to place an implant at four o'clock on Thursday Sunday. afternoon in Roosevelt, Utah, you photo activate it on Wednesday at four o'clock in Roosevelt. So basically that's not going to fly for me because I don't even know what I'm doing 24 hours from now. But anyway, Dio shows up late because they didn't have much to set up, just this beautiful machine. And when the other competitors saw it, you pay a fortune to have a booth space at the IDS. They packed up and left. They knew they had no prayer of a chance. And then I was a little bit, uh, I'll just tell you, I was a little bit skeptical. Is this really real or is this hocus pocus? And I flew down to UCLA where the uh, uh, UV uh, specialist of the world is a, a dentist, doctor, researcher named Dr. Ogawa. 
and we left him a machine and a bunch of the UV activated implants. And he wrote back six weeks later after a preliminary research, he said, you guys have something I've never seen in photo functionalization. And I am the world expert. And what you have is very special. And there'll be forthcoming uh, uh, papers done by Ogawa showing the science behind it, which I don't really care about other than it works. Again, tune in in two weeks. We'll get you some more information. We're going to be talking a lot about this. Let us show you just kind of the end results of this. So here is a, a wet test. They're going to put these down in um, some saline, and then you're going to see the hydrophilic nature. To the left, am I allowed to say brand name? Oh, that's a Strawman. Okay. You can say whatever you okay. want because we're in your house. Okay, perfect. So yeah, that's a hydrophilic Strawman. Yeah, all of these are not the regular implant. These are all the hydrophilic implants. So on the right is Strawman. I should say on the left of the screen is Strawman. In the middle is the DO implant, and to the left is the hyacinth hydrophilic. So this is the hydrophilic versus hydrophilic versus hydrophilic show off. It's a fast video, so pay attention. Here they go. Dang. Gosh dang. Gosh dang, that's amazing. Um, so that's kind of the proof in the pudding. Let me show you one more video. It's kind of fascinating. And this video on the bottom, even though it looks like it's going to be a still image, it's actually a live video the whole time. So here is a water test. But so look at this. This video, it looks like nothing's happening. That is still plain, and there's no change to it. That is what a normal surface would look like after you activate the surface. Gosh dang. Or as I like to say, sweet mercy. I yeah, mean. That's, that's impressive. To me, you know, water's... Uh, I don't know the science here, but the water is 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 uh, more viscous than blood. But this needs to wet the implant to optimize blood implant contact translates to bone implant contact, which translates to a stable, healthy, long-term implant for a long, long time. And the bioactivity of an implant is enhanced. And we'll talk more in two weeks. I think you'll love it. I hope you come in to that, uh, that webinar because we're, we're ferociously preparing for that and hope to not disappoint anybody. So really, really cool. End of the day, the implants are going to heal faster. Can you imagine how patients are going to enjoy that? Um, they're going to be stronger attached to the bone with a higher BIC, bone to implant contact. This is, this is a game changer in the industry, no question about it. Um, and we're going to, like I said, talk more in two but weeks. This was, this was a big why for us. Why are we going to make a switch? Yeah. I what mean, are we going to do? This is, this is very, very state of the art. Um, another point, custom protocols. Now, again, we gave a whole lecture on this two weeks ago, so I don't want to talk too much about this. But if you're just tuning in now, this is what a drilling protocol looks like from DO. It shows you in a picture form, every drill, the depth that you push it to. If there's not a depth stop, there's only about two drills that don't have a depth stop. You have black lines. Notice on the bottom where it says D3, D1, D2, they give you like a highway, different exit points where you can jump off the drilling highway based on bone density. Part of the custom protocol though, is you will also get a bone density report with Hounsfield unit analysis that shows you both physically on the buccal, mesial, lingual, distal view. So here, the implant pictures. And then graphically, you will see it here. Um, this is really, really cool. So this implant, obviously, the majority of it is going to be D3 with little specks. Notice the little specks of blue, a little bit of D2 in a couple of spots. But this is going to be more like a D2, a D3 type drill. And the drilling protocol tells you already what the optimal way of drilling the D3 osteotomy would be. I, I find I look at these every time. I know many of you on watching this are DO users. I, I would challenge you, go into your paperwork that's delivered in the box and make sure you're looking at that because it's, I find it very collaborative. I know before I start what I'm up against. And in the planning, if they find that it's really weak and you order a custom abutment, they're going to get back to you and say, we don't advise primary or immediate load. 
highlight that secondary feedback to what I'm trying to do. Because honestly, when I say to the patient, I'll, I'll try to give you a custom about and, and a temporary, um, I don't know all the stuff at that moment in time, but as they plan it, then I know it, and then I can be more prepared. And then all of this obviously would be uh, put into your uh, document center by a, a, you know, scanning it and, and putting it into a document center for risk management for uh, your thought processing of the case, which I think is amazing. Okay, so that's the custom uh, drilling protocol I think is really unique. And like he said, the planning part of it might be the coolest part. You're seeing this before you know, the guide is even made. I shouldn't say you are, but the, um, the lab is, and if they can catch some red flags if there are any. Um, and so that's, that's um, the issue there. So um, pretty awesome. Let me jump now and talk about anatomical abutments real quick. So the anatomical abutment this was made by taking the average of thousands and thousands and thousands of custom abutments per tooth position, and they took some anatomical averages from those custom abutments and made what we call anatomical abutment. So basically, if you could imagine a hierarchy, and let's say a stock abutment is at the lowest, and a custom abutment is at the very top of this hierarchy, an anatomical abutment would be right in the middle. This is not a, a, a custom abutment, but it's pretty dang close to one. And this abutment is clever because it doubles as a scan body. And why that is compelling is you can put an implant in, same moment you can put in an anatomical abutment and put a temporary in. After proper healing of the implant, you can simply remove the temporary, clean up some cement, scan with an intraoral scanner, this anatomical abutment and that anatomical abutment acts as a scan body for the lab. With that, they know exactly where the implant position is and they know exactly all of the data you would get from a scan body and they can design a new crown or better yet, let's say your crown was perfect. The, the PMMA temporary crown was perfect the day of surgery. Nothing needs adjustment on it. All you do is give the, off the lab a shade and they can just mill the exact thing right there without even an, uh, an impression because they already know the anatomy based on the pre-surgical workup. This is really, really cool and it highlights a principle of what we call muco integration, which is a soft tissue integration with the titanium transmucosal area of the abutment. We know as we take things in and out, in and out, that we lose that soft tissue connection and that biologic seal disappears with the disappearing of the seal, bacteria gets down there, higher incidence of peri-implantitis. And I, I feel that the etiology of, of uh, peri-implantitis is directly related to this, the, the protocols we have set to take things, healing abutment out, you know, a transfer abutment in, and then a transfer out and a healing abutment in. I would give you a little pearl, and some of you have heard this before. Anytime you take a healing abutment out, which uh, could be called a gingiformer or, uh, yeah, so a healing abutment, when you have it out, as soon as you take it out with a cold uh, alcohol two by two, wipe it down, sterilize it, get rid of all that crevicular yuck. If that sits on the workbench for uh, 20 minutes, it's gonna become a biofilm and it's not gonna come off and it's gonna set up a bad day for reattachment. So I love this anatomic abutment. I think it's one of the coolest ideas I've ever seen because my goal is to put that custom abutment in as much as I can, as fast as I can and never take it out. Riley, I could also, if I, I didn't like the buckle contours of the anatomic abutment, it healed a little differently than I expected. I could just prep that in the mouth and then I could scan it. Yep. And they could have that just like a static scan of a CEREC. That's right. And do that. Uh, so I do really appreciate the thoughtfulness of this. Uh, and, and I think that it is the future and I think it will mitigate uh, a great deal of our heartbreaks with this peri-implantitis disease that I think that we're propagating. We're propagating that by following protocol that we've been taught. 
So we have to rethink and maybe re-educate ourselves on how to do that more biologically savvy. I think that you know, Mark just asked a question, you know, why use this versus a custom abutment? I think there's two big advantages. The workflow for this, number one, helps with that soft tissue integration. The custom abutment workflow does not offer that the way this would be, because this would go in the time of surgery with deepithelialized tissue. The second thing, just real practically speaking, these are a lot less um, expensive than a true custom abutment. Um, a custom abutment, you're going to pay more money. Lab turnaround time will also be higher because it has to be custom made, where these are actually just inventoried in our lab. And so I think those are some of your advantages. I think a custom abutment is still a fantastic option. You might consider de-epithelializing the tissue when you seat a custom abutment after, let's say, a healing abutment has been in for an extended period of time to help propagate some type of soft tissue and, attachment. And sterilize that. But here's, here's a little tidbit I, I think we failed to mention. This anatomic abutment is created through hundreds of thousands of data points through artificial intelligence. Of custom abutments. Of custom abutments. Or where a custom abutment would be made for a number four, for example. So we took that data from artificial intelligence and we built a, a standard with a standard deviation negative and a standard deviation positive. So three anatomical abutments for every tooth site which to me is a custom abutment if that helps. So what is the difference between an anatomical abutment and a custom abutment? One was pre-done, FDA approved, and was done before the surgery. The other one is done after. Is a custom abutment better than an anatomical? I would argue they are the same. If the data that we created these is right, which it has proven to be right in my hands with my patients, then I think you, you know, so I didn't mean to confuse your answer, Riley, because I'm not agreeing that they're totally different. I think they're very, very similar, but, uh, you know, I've found them to be very amazing. And I, and I like your explanation that they are, uh, you know, wholesale produced, but wholesale FDA approved. And we're, we have to have FDA approval on everything we grind in our uh, lab so that we're not, you know, cheating you or your patient, and that, that costs more money, clearly. Okay, so let's talk about um, one of the other really unique features about DIO, which is, again, this web-based portal um, and their vir virtual simulations. Um, let me just organize a couple things here. Again, just in the review, we are a White Cap Institute. We're partners with DO Implant Company, and so we work together and we provide input for them. And this is one thing where they've really been impressive for us in terms of how they've been able to help us train doctors and keep them um, just really in um, tune with some of the workflows of DO Navi. So everything is web-based. So you don't need to be in your office. You can be at any computer in, any, in the world and you can upload files. You could confirm implant position. You could um, look at the status of your cases and you can review what's called the simulation. I'm excited to show that for you. Let me show you real quick how cases are uploaded. You go to their website, click orders, say order DO Navi, and a screen like this pops up. It's really quick. It's one, two, three, four. So one is the doctor information and the patient information along with the surgery date. That is often just auto-populated other than the patient name and surgery date. Then you select your teeth. So this little chart here of teeth, you simply click the teeth that have the same treatment plan, and then you go down to number three where it says order type. So for example, if you're gonna do number three and four and you want custom abutments and crowns, but number 20 you're gonna do and you want just a healing abutment, you're gonna do those two orders separately, meaning you're gonna click three and four, assign it the order type and hit apply. And then you're going to go to number 20 and uh, assign it a different type of order, meaning no custom abutments. You want, let's say, the healing abutment. So I, here's a little example. I'm going to select all of these teeth, and I'm going to say every one of them, I want a surgical <clears throat> guide. I want a custom abutment made out of titanium with a hex. You can change it to no hex. You could have a zirconia abutment made. 
you could have selected a stock abutment or an anatomical abutment. So this is just a drop down, each one of these that has arrows, and you can select different options. You can say where you want the margin. Do you want it equal gingival, sub gingival, a millimeter, or a half millimeter? And then different seating jigs, like an abutment seating jig, um, and then your temporary crown and the material. So all of these things are basically the script <clears throat> for whatever implant sites you selected. Where do you put the color, Riley? The color is up at the top. If I go back here, there's a shade kit with the teeth selected. You'll hit the shade kit and select the shade. So the shade could conceivably be different on each, each one, one of, of those. Each one of those, exactly, exactly. <clears throat> So from there, then you'll get a report that looks like this. The screen will show you what the plan is. And if you look at it, everything that is assigned to that specific tooth shows up right here. PK was fortuitous in his question because the shade is not listed here. The shade is the last piece of information that would have to be added. But this is a nice little review screen for you to see where, um, where your order is and what you're asking for. So you think I'm fortuitous? What in the heck does that mean? I don't know. It just seemed fortuitous, fortuitous. to use the word. You are full of it, Riley. Thank you. Fortuitously. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what the ordering looks like. Um, I often make a, um, you know, my treatment plan, I write it down on paper. It goes in the patient's chart and my staff, they're the, actually the ones that upload all of this. Um, so this isn't something I'm actually doing. Um, I'm doing it paper form and then they go and translate it to the upload themselves. From here, this is probably my favorite part of a web-based portal is the ability to see the status of all of my cases. So I can go into order status. I can sort it by different categories like just submitted, the planning is in progress, how many have already been shipped, things like that. And then I can just look at them all and see the status visually if I want to see them here. So my staff loves this because they're always wondering, hey, is that ready? Is that ready? What do we need to do for this? All of the communication with the lab happens through this portal. And it's just really convenient to go to one spot. Um, you know, everyone's done it where you call, then you're on hold, then you're playing phone tag because the assistant who called is now in a surgery. And then you go back and forth and it takes a week before the two people connect. This is really nice because it just happens whenever you want. You log in and you see what's going on. And so I really like that online portal there. Um, this is what the review page looks like when you do log in. You have um, all of these different, the XYZ axis to look at for the implant planning, a panel, and then a 3D um, view. And with all those views, you can determine if you like the implant position. Um, and so it's really just practical. So that's kind of what my workflow is. Upload. My assistants do that for me. I log in, hit confirm if I like what I'm seeing. If I don't, we request modifications. And then in one package, I get my implant, um, whatever abutments or crowns I may have ordered, my drilling protocol, all of that just comes in one case. So the case packaging is really nice, again, for organizational purposes. I think it's important to understand this portal is HIPAA compliant. This is so important to us. There's so much uh, emphasis put on patient confidentiality. And when we're shooting things through cyberspace, it's, it's protected. I don't know exactly how it works. Do you? The HIPAA compliance? Yeah. No, it's just, I mean, it's just encrypted portal. So, it, so it's know, the an data is protected. Yeah. And I think just you have good peace of mind knowing years ago, a, a, a HIPAA compliant portal was super, super expensive per month. Now it's a little less, but we do have it. It comes with your, your program. So let me show you, we have one video here. It's a little bit long. And I know as we talk over the video, it's a little bit <clears throat> um, hard to hear us, but there is a lot of dialogue here. This video I think is really helpful. This is highlighting the simulation. I'm gonna go ahead and push play. And when we do talk, we're gonna try to talk loud if we're gonna talk over the video but I think this highlights it really well. Hi, my name is Dr. Riley Clark. I'm gonna be doing a quick tutorial on the new simulation that we have on the DO Navi website. To get started, you're gonna to go to order.donavi.com. You're going to log in, go under order, and then order status. And then you're gonna check for any cases that are confirmed manufacturing or shipped anything in these three categories when you click into those will have this simulation tab here on the top this simulation tab 
is where you can click into each case and do the simulated surgery. So I'm going to go ahead and click this one right here. It's going to bring up this new window. A few things I'd like to point out here. On the left, you have all of your patient information, the platform of implants that are going to be placed, the day of your surgery, and the required surgical kits for the case. So if there were multiple kits required, such as an edentulous case or a sinus case, you would see all of those kits there. There are some precautions here that you can read that are just general guidelines um, for surgery. I'm going to go ahead to the top right and click Surgery Preview. From here, this just gives you an overview of the implants and the relevant implant information, including diameter, length, um, offset, all of those details just in a quick reference as a preview. We're going to go ahead and click the top right, Locate Tooth Position. In this window, you'll be able to select the teeth that you would like to simulate. So in this case, we have an implant in number eight and number nine. We can select just eight, just nine, or both of them. And then those are highlighted in red, showing that they will be part of the simulation. I wanna highlight one part right here. You see just to the left here of this implant box, it says D1, D2, and D3. Those are the different bone density drilling protocols. It has been determined that these implants follow a D3 protocol, but if you would like to see the simulation in a D2 or D1, you simply click the different boxes there. In this case, we're gonna stick with D3. I'm gonna change it just for simplicity purposes to just worry about implant number eight. So I've selected eight, it's highlighted in red. I'm gonna go ahead and start the simulated surgery. Okay, there's a lot to take in here. Let me start by highlighting um, just a few fun things here. On the top right, you're seeing the exact screenshots of the DICOMs from your case. So these are indeed the implants um, planned in the CT that you provided the lab for fabrication. So that is unique to each case. That will change obviously with each case. On the top left, this is your tooth number. They're saying it is a normal case. What normal means in this case is it is not a sinus, it is not an extraction site, it is not a simultaneous grafting case. They designate the word normal as essentially virgin bone without any ancillary procedures. Here you have the fixture listed. It is a 3.8 um, fixture there. On the top here, you see the number eight listed. This is actually every drill in the sequence. So this is kind of like a timeline for the video simulation that's gonna be played on the bottom. I'm gonna go back to the beginning. Think of this as like the different chapters to a DVD. You can fast forward to the next chapter or the next chapter. We wanna start in the beginning. The carousel of drills down here, you can also go next by just clicking the next arrow. And then we will show the simulation here in just a second but all of this and the um, recorder settings are all right here. Here's probably the coolest part of this whole thing. On the left here, um, these three boxes provide really great insight um, to help you as the clinician understand the case, the components listed um, in the drilling protocol, um, and kind of the why behind them. So let me start with the top box. This is just a nice overview that shows you the drills and components from the surgical kit that will be required. You also have a lot number down on the bottom, so if something was missing, you know exactly what lot number it is to communicate to the store um, to buy new parts and pieces. This is really cool. This is an actual clinical video showing how whatever component of the kit that is next to be used is to be used. And it has some different text um, helping you understand exactly how to use that instrument. For example, if I click to the next drill, click video, this is a different video showing that same drill um, that's being highlighted here, the flattening drill. If I go to the pilot drill 2.0, same sort of thing, you see the initial 2.0 drill being used in a clinical video. Again, just help you understand how to use that. Similarly, down in the very bottom box, bottom left here, you click that and it will have specific instructions, insights, tips and tricks to how to use 
the drill that you are currently selected on. And so this again is for the 2.0 initial drill. If I go back to the bone flattening drill and click this same box, you will again see different measurements, different descriptions of how to use it, tips and tricks, um, even some x-rays showing kind of what the drill is intended to do. Before, you might have this uneven surface, and after its use, you will have more of a flat surface. That is the purpose of the bone flattening drill, along with corresponding pictures and measurements, just to make it abundantly clear what the purpose of each drill is. So let me go back to the beginning, um, and I'm gonna go ahead and play this, and you're gonna hear the actual simulation taking place. What I wanna highlight here again is that there's a lot of help in this window. You will see a simulation actually right here. You will have different text boxes to help provide specific insight to each of the steps of the drilling sequence. And then you're again seeing live shots of the DICOM file and the implant being planned there. So I'm gonna go ahead and press, press play and you will see this in action. Punch, tissue punch at 100 RPM on eight. So you're seeing exactly how to use the instrument, what it will look like clinically drill. with a little simulation. Drill, bone flattening drill at 100 RPM on eight. Drill tube, install. Drill, initial drill, 2.0 millimeter diameter by 5.0 millimeters at 100 RPM on eight. So essentially it, it will go through the protocol. I'm gonna stop it there versus looking at all the drills. This is just a great resource. And so some of the resources that are available to us as clinicians with our implants, I think is really important. If you're someone that maybe doesn't do implants every day, every hour, uh, maybe you wanna brush up on some of this stuff, or if you're considering switching to a new system, you want a new system to be very easy to switch to. And so some of these resources are just really, really thoughtful. You think of the energy, the money to make something like this. Um, we were just really impressed at DO from a company standpoint, their willingness to invest resources to create the user experience that is just more graceful than just trying to figure it out on your own. Um, and so we, we are really proud of things like this. We're constantly improving and updating things like this at Whitecap and DO. Um, and so we're really happy with that. But that's what the, um, the simulation looks like. You can go back and look at it as many times as you want. You can show it to patients if they wanted to see kind of what the process looks like. Um, it can be whatever you want, but it's a great little thing. We've teased doctors. You just put it up right during surgery and you just follow what it tells you to do. The patients love that when you're following what a computer is telling you to do. And you could have that saved and you could use that as a risk management uh, tool as well. Yeah, you could put this in their chart and say, here was our protocol. We reviewed it. Um, it, it's a really, really thoughtful simulation up there. And what I think is really cool is even though this is animated here in, in this, this is the actual uh, CBCT slices of your patient, their bone density, your planning, and it all comes together here. Many years ago, 30 years ago plus, I started doing implants. I would role play with my dental assistant team all about the different things I wanted them to do. Now you'll do this, I'll do that. This kind of does a role play. Exactly. It could be a very good teaching instrument uh, for your team. So we're totally like 15 minutes over, um, but I think that was helpful. Um, Hi. Lastly, I just want to thank everyone for their attention. And I want you to let you know next week, we have a really cool topic. It's going to be all about the implant consult. Um, you know, that's for the last, I don't know, 15 years of PK at least, that's all he does is implants. For me, my whole career, which is only, you know, five, six years, but all I do is implants. And so both of us have some insight on what the implant consult could look like. It's gonna be more of a discussion. We'll have a few slides and show you a, a few visuals that we might use. We also invited my younger brother, Tom. He's not a non-dentist. He owns, um, I think it's 12, 15 dental offices. He's gonna be here also to provide some different business insight. I think that's gonna be a really good one. I, I'm really excited about this. I don't care uh, if how good you are clinically, if you can't sell it, you can't do it. And this allows you to have down to earth, 
37 years of implant experience of always putting the patient first and, and never doing anything outside of what you feel is the very, very best. And we happily share it with you. It'll be the same time next week. Um, but thanks for being here today. This was, this was a gratifying hour of my time. I hope that, that some of the stuff that we shared hits home, becomes clinically applicable uh, very soon as we get our offices open back up, which I think is gonna happen uh, sooner than later. So appreciate your attendance. Thank you. We'll see you next week, two o'clock in a Quarantineville, which is my office. And uh, looking forward to the topic, the implant consult. See you there. Be safe, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.